Saturday. Christmas comes early. Unbelievable! Welcome to this incredible scene. Bills. To the end zone! Chargers. It's a touchdown! An exclusive NFL game. This is fantastic! Live in primetime. Wow! Only on Peacock. With a Christmas gift to their fans. They're having some fun now. Bills versus Chargers. Saturday, 7.30 Eastern. Exclusively on Peacock. Hello, welcome to Pod Maverick After Dark, After Morning in this case. It's Saturday morning, November 4th. Um, as you can tell by listening to this, we are not recording after the Mavericks uh, lost to the Denver Nuggets in Denver last night, Friday night. It was a late game for those of us uh, outside of the mountain and western time zones. And, you know, real life occasionally happens. Uh, Kirk's posted this on social media, so I feel like it's okay to talk about it uh, on the pod. But him and his wife uh, welcomed a new uh, baby boy uh, uh, earlier this week. So clearly, um, Kirk would record from the hospital room uh, last night if he if he could, if he had the ability to. Uh, if you know Kirk at all, uh, he, he would do this uh, after the, the nuclear holocaust uh, and civilization. I mean, he... Uh, he will record, he will record, he will write, he will edit whenever um, life gives him a chance because he really does live and breathe uh, doing this Mavs work. Uh, it's it's really quite something, but I'm doing my best to hold him off so he can have some free time to enjoy with his newborn baby. Uh, unfortunately, real life popped up for me too. Had some really close friends that don't live in the state uh, come into town this week. Friday night was the only night that they were available since, you know, they're trying to see family and other family members when they're when they get the limited time they have to to be in te- back in Texas. So, hey, life happens. So we didn't get a, a a podcast recorded last night, but we did have the game on uh, while we had some friends over. So I did get to watch it, and unfortunately, it was not a good game for the Mavericks. They suffer their first loss of the season, one twenty five one fourteen to the Denver Nuggets at home. It was the first game of the NBA in season tournament. If that's your thing. Uh, personally, I could take it or leave it, but uh, hey, I, I'm not going to knock anyone for for wanting to to enjoy something uh, like this, and and maybe we'll get some really fun competitive games from this down the line. Um, took me a while to get used to the new court, the Nuggets uh, blue and and yellow or blue and gold colored court. It was pretty wild. It was a little trippy and and distracting almost, I, I think. But I, I appreciate the NBA for trying to like do something new to to differentiate this from like a normal uh, game since it's their part of the season tournament, the group play. Uh, so the Mavericks are now 0-1 in group play, and they're also 4-1 on the season. This game, you know, the Nuggets win by 11, final margin of 11. It was probably not as close as the score would indicate because the Nuggets just absolutely manhandled the Mavericks in the first quarter. They start 40-24. to They dominate on the boards. They dominate in the paint. And the Mavericks, to their credit, just kind of kept it close. Um, I don't think they were ever really within realistic range to maybe scare the Nuggets enough. You know, it was never a one-possession game. I think in the second half, um, I don't even think it was a a single-score game. Maybe it was like nine points, but it was never a one-possession game. So the Nuggets never really had to stress out too much. But the Mavericks did enough to where the Nuggets had to play all their starters for most of the game on the first night of a, of a back-to-back. So that might, you know, the Nuggets probably were hoping that they could rest their starters uh, in the fourth quarter, seeing they have, uh, have another game playing today. And the Mavericks wouldn't let them because, you know, they just kind of kept chipping away, kind of like last season. Um, I hate to invoke uh, last season's Mavericks, but this game kind of felt like one of the last season's games where 
they kind of get down big to a good team, but they never get really blown out because they just keep pecking away because their three-point shooting advantage is just tremendous. Um, the Mavericks made 17 threes. The Nuggets made 13. Um, four more three-pointers, uh, you know, a 12, basically plus 12 at the three-point line. In a game you lose by 11, um, you, that just goes to show how important the three-point shot is to Mavericks. Because if the Mavericks had a poor three-point shooting night, I mean, this is a 20, 30-point uh, win for the Nuggets. So, again, kind of like last season where the Mavericks just refused to get blown out because their shooting keeps them in every single game. But they just couldn't do enough to get over the hump. Um, the Nuggets scored. This is not not a typo. They scored 68 points in the paint. Uh, and they had 19 offensive rebounds. I mean, they just bully balled the Mavericks all night. Um, Jokic was absolutely tremendous. Um, 30, 33 points, 14 rebounds, nine assists, only four turnovers. He was 14 of 16 from the field. Basically, every Nuggets starter uh, had a pretty pretty decent box uh, box score night. Uh, Jamal Murray didn't shoot the ball well, but he had 18 points and 13 assists. Uh, Michael Porter Jr. did shoot the ball well, uh, 24 points uh, on 18 shots, made four threes, and also defended Luka Doncic about as well as anyone's defended him so far this season. I know Doncic had the the struggles against Chicago, but that felt kind of more like a team effort. Um, Porter, as an individual one-on-one, did a really good job. And if Michael Porter Jr. is going to turn into some above-average or defensive stopper-type wing in addition to the offense he brings, uh, this, this Nuggets team has even another gear to it that we didn't see last season because Porter hasn't been a great defender in the NBA so far in his time in the league. So that's pretty scary because they've already got Aaron Gordon, Contavious Caldwell Pope. I mean, their starting lineup is just, it's perfect. It's its the best, best fivesome in the NBA, in my opinion. And I really don't know how teams can stop it when they're geared up to want to win a game. Of course, it's the bench that's the Nuggets' Achilles heel. Basically, all of their be- a lot of their bench guys uh, were were minuses, and that's when the Mavericks really made their runs in the game. They, I think, the one thing the Mavericks were pretty smart to do to try to get back into it. I mean, they're kind of forced to play. You know, Luca and Kyrie, who came back from his foot injury, you know, they kind of had to play their big guns a lot of minutes because when you're in a blowout, if you want to try to make a comeback, you know, you're not going to get back in the game with bench guys typically. Um, so the Mavericks did a good job at, at keeping Luka and Kyrie on the floor when the Nuggets would go to their bench. And that's usually when the Mavericks made their runs. Unfortunately, they couldn't make the run big enough. So the Nuggets starters come back in and then they kind of cru- they kind of cruise the, to the end of the game whenever those moments happened. Um, again, this just kind of shows the Mavericks are, are still a work in progress. Um, I, I think in our recap, uh, Matt Gilroy wrote our recap, had a really poignant line where he was like, you know, the, the Mavericks are still a work in progress, working in new pieces, and the Nuggets are a, a well-oiled machine. And you can just see the stark differences uh, between the two teams in that way. Um, this isn't a loss that I don't think should should down Mavericks fans too much uh, because I don't think anyone should have had realistic expectations that this team was a title contender coming off uh 38 wins last season this gotta take some baby steps there's gonna be some games like this they're still incorporating new pieces new players into the rotation it was never gonna be a one summer fix is kind of my mantra for mavericks fans after every loss uh that will happen this season you know don't try to freak out too much because there's work to be done i think you know everyone had that kind of expect i hope everyone sort of had that expectations even in training camp there's going to be nights like this, you know, there's going to be nights where Derek Lively looks like a rookie and he had uh, four points uh, and four rebounds in, in 24 minutes, kind of highlighting the Mavericks rebounding struggles. He was, he just got bullied in the, on the boards, which happens. He's a, he's a, he's a rookie uh, that hasn't filled out his body yet. He's still working to get strength to match NBA level uh, talent. And when you go against what is probably the best front court in the NBA, Nikola Jokic, Aaron Gordon, and even Michael Porter Jr., that's a lot of beef on the Nuggets. And, and you could see that throughout the game. It wasn't just lively. You know, Grant Williams did his best, but he's also a little undersized. You know, Derek Jones Jr. is 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 lengthy and athletic, but he's also a little – he's very slight. And you, know, you have Josh Green trying to trying to guard Aaron Gordon, doing his best. But, again, these guys are just, just really small. Um, you just look up and down the box score and the, and the rebounds – it just tells a story, you know, Lively had four in 24 minutes. Dwight Powell had one in 16 minutes. Um, Josh Green did a decent job with five in 27 minutes, but it's just hard to win 
when your when your wings and your big men are just not grabbing rebounds. Also, Maxi Kleba didn't play because of an injury he suffered against the Bulls, which I believe was his foot or ankle. But Kyrie did come back, and I kind of want to talk a little bit about how Kyrie looked. But first, we're going to do the thing where we're going to take a little bit of a break uh, because we need to get an ad read in, and this is where I'm going to do the thing that Kirk does. You know, like the stream, subscribe to our channel, Pod Maverick, both on YouTube and and wherever you listen. If you're listening to our audio only feed, you know, listen wherever you listen to the show or wherever you watch the show. Uh, like us, subscribe to us, leave us good reviews. It really helps us out uh, tremendously. So we're gonna take a quick pause, and then we're gonna come back, and then I'm I'm gonna start with talking about Kyrie, who who came back for the first time after a couple of weeks, or sorry, a couple of weeks, couple of games. So we'll be right back. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire faster. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. One of the things I love about Indeed is it makes hiring all in one place so easy and streamlined so I can spend more time on the rest of my business. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash Blue Wire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Okay, we're back. Sorry for people watching live uh, or watching, you know, online. Um, <laughs> no, it can be a little awkward, but we got to get those those ads in for our audio only listeners. So talked a bit about the game briefly in the first half of the pod uh, before we went to to our quick break. I wanted to talk about some more, you know, interesting storylines. Kyrie came back. Uh, I think that was kind of the big news for this game. Um, he'd been dealing with a, a foot strain and considering where he was last season, dealing with a hurt foot, um, plantar fasciitis, I think was talked about with him. I can't remember if that was officially confirmed what he was suffering through, but for guards over the age of 30 at his size, um, it is not great to have foot issues. So, um, that's always a big cause for concern. Um, so when he went out those last couple of games with a foot injury, you kind of don't know because that's something you don't want to get wrong. Like if you mess up a foot injury, um, shouts to, to Rodrigo Bois back in the day where he broke his foot in the summer of 2010, and that basically derailed his career. He just never got back um, to the level that he wanted to in the NBA. And thankfully he had a good European career. But we're not talking about Boo Bois. This is a Mavericks game. We're talking 2023 Mavericks. Just trying to say, you know, you just don't want to mess with feet injuries. They they can really bother you. So for Irving to come back and to look relatively sharp, um, considering the layoff, considering how he looked before he he went out with his injury, I thought he looked pretty good. Um, 22 points on 15 shots. I think he was very, very good inside the three-point line. Obviously, the three-point shot, he is still just slumping tremendously. He was one of five from three. I think I read that that one three-point make bumped his season-long three-point percentage from 12% to 15%. So clearly um, he needs to kind of heat up from the outside for this Mavericks team to look fully operational. But he was tremendous uh, in the paint uh, inside the three-point line. He had seven assists, three turnovers. I thought he moved the ball well. He had four steals, which was nice. But outside of the steals, I think his size and defense was a little suspect. To be honest, I think Irving and Doncic just didn't play as well as they need to on the defensive end. Not to say that they need to be stoppers or, you know, tremendous defenders, but they just need to be, you know, near average uh, for this Mavericks team to thrive. And I thought both, both of them were a little bit below average, especially like in team concepts, rotating, 
making their rotations, um, trying to keep guys out of the paint. It's it's tough. Um, you know, these guys are have the entire responsibility of the offense on their shoulders to also ask them to exert energy on the defensive end that can make it tough, especially playing in Denver with altitude against a great team. So it, it just it just wasn't the Mavericks night there. But I thought Kyrie, even with some of the defensive issues, three point shot issues, I think overall this was a positive step getting him back on the court and seeing him be overall productive. This was probably offensively his most productive game. I think this season, I know he had 22 points in the opener against the Spurs and had a great fourth quarter, but he still overall didn't shoot the ball very well. You know, he made 60% of his shots tonight, which is the best mark he's had this season. So again, baby steps, hopefully getting him back into the flow. Hopefully he's feeling better with his foot and maybe that three point shot will will look a little bit better. Um, Otherwise, you know, it was just a tough night. I think for the Mavericks, um, I don't think this says anything season long about the team that we didn't already know. They're still a smaller team. I think despite the moves they made in the off season to try to address their size issues, drafting Derek Lively, drafting uh, Olivier Maxens Prosper, uh, acquiring Grant Williams, Derek Jones Jr., just acquiring more wing and big, uh, big men that are athletic and can play uh, up and down the floor. There's still probably another big wing, big forward away from, from feeling like a complete contender. You know, Grant Williams, I think, is is doing his best at the four. But ideally, you'd probably like him to play the three and maybe have a little bit of a more dynamic forward at the four next to him instead of, you know, Derek Jones Jr., who is doing really as much as he can do considering what the Mavericks are asking of him and consider he's a veteran's minimum guy. Um, but you probably in the future want to upgrade that spot to have like a more dynamic forward that's bigger, longer, more athletic, can maybe do a little bit more things, kind of like how the Nuggets felt like they took their next step when they acquired Aaron Gordon. Like, I think the Mavericks are still missing their Aaron Gordon or their Michael Porter Jr., however you want to say it. You know, you know the, the Nuggets have those two forwards next to, next to Jokic, and the Mavericks have, you know, a rookie and lively at center, Grant Williams, who is a tremendous acquisition, and then after that, Derek Joe Jr., which feels kind of like a piecemeal, like, like a stepping stone, so to speak. He's playing well, but, you know, I think at the end of the the tunnel, the roadmap of this Mavericks roster, you want to upgrade that spot. So this is the kind of matchup that really exposes that because, again, the Nuggets' front line is just – they're huge. They're huge and they're skilled. Um, that's one of the things. You know, Gordon is – you know, I feel like Gordon, since coming to Denver, has been a little – I don't want to say underrated, but it's been kind of overlooked how – skillful of a player he was that he got to show off a little bit more in Orlando. Of course, the Magic didn't win a lot of games when he was there, but he did more in Orlando than he's doing in Denver necessarily. Like his responsibility is is completely different. In a game like tonight, you see he had six assists uh, in addition to two steals and a block and eight rebounds. Like he's, he's a really talented multidimensional wing that just doesn't have to do as much as he used to because the Nuggets are so, uh, so stacked. So that's like a real big luxury. Feel like his acquisition is kind of like when the Nuggets felt complete. So the Mavericks are still looking for theirs. I think did a lot of good work over the summer um, to address their issues, but you know there's still more work to be done. So um, you know we're about 17 minutes in. We've talked about the offense, talked about the defense. Uh, like I said, offensively, I think the Mavericks looked about as good as they could considering who they were playing. Um, Luca looked good offensively. I thought, uh, you know, nine turnovers was not great, but the Mavericks only had 15 as a team, which is actually that's high for them, that 15 number. But considering Doncic had nine of them, uh, I think that's actually okay. Uh, Doncic was a little sloppy, but still made his threes, six of 11 from three. And again, you know, the Mavericks, if Doncic is shooting threes at a high clip, you know, they're going to turn lot close losses into wins they're going to turn blowouts into competitive games and they're going to turn you know close wins into into blowout wins for themselves because that's really something this team hasn't had since Josh has been here he's always been hovering somewhere between you know around 32 34 35 percent he's on a tear right now that that he hasn't had to start a season in a while he's shooting you know almost upwards of 50 percent from three close to 50 percent and if he's making threes, that just kind of feels like a cheat code because that's been the one struggle of his offensive game, I think. So he made 6-11 from three. Again, Mavericks made 17 threes as a team compared to the Nuggets 13. That's just that's the Mavericks cheat code. They can just stay competitive in every game because of their three-point shooting. 
Uh, I thought it was nice to see Josh Green bounce back offensively. I think he struggled with the Nuggets' size, but otherwise I think he looked pretty good. Jaden Hardy coming in and hit two three-pointers. Um, some of them felt like really nice momentum threes that he made that got the lead down to like 10 or 11, uh, keeping the game within range. But again, his size struggled a little bit on defense. Um, this was kind of the first Tim Hardaway Jr. game to kind of come back down to earth. I know he's had some some roller coaster moments within games, but uh, he's been at like right above 17, 18, 19 points in every game. He's had scored nine points. Uh, again, the Mavericks don't typically play well when he doesn't score a lot. So, again, that kind of explains fourth quarter getting down big. Uh, the fact that they were able to make a comeback without him necessarily lighting it up. I mean, if you want to look at the glass uh, half full, uh, that's a way to look at it. But I don't think this is anything more than a measuring stick game for the Mavericks. And they didn't measure up, but that's okay. You know, that's not a cause to ring any alarm bells or flag that something's like a red flag for the season. The Nuggets are probably the best team in the NBA uh, and the Mavericks just aren't there yet. So Nothing to really worry about, I think, coming out of this game. I like to see how the Mavericks respond to this game because their schedule does get a little harder uh, going forward. Um, they play a Nuggets team that has given them all sorts of issues over the last uh, 12 months. So so we'll see how they respond, but they should still be favored to win that game. But after that, Orlando, Toronto, Clippers, Pelicans twice, um, those are some teams that can, can give the Mavericks some issues. So Orlando and Toronto – are both really athletic younger teams that can muck it up and kind of create a game like the Bulls game that they can just kind of bring you down into that, <laughs> into the muck and, and try to win a mud fight. Um, so those are going to be two tough games. The Clippers look absolutely great. And that's before James Harden has played. Um, how you feel about James Harden might make that either a good thing or a bad thing uh, for the, for the Mavericks um, going forward. Uh, so we'll see how they look, but they're playing really well. Pelicans, two games in New Orleans back-to-back. That's also pretty tough. Um, and the Pelicans are also a team that's playing well. So easy part of the schedule is over. San Antonio, Brooklyn, Memphis, Chicago wasn't exactly a murderer's row, but those are not games that the Mavericks always would have won last season. So again, I think the team is on the right track. I think that's the best way to look at it. They're not necessarily over exceeding my expectations because I thought that this team could win 45 games and maybe avoid the play-in. I feel like they look just about that kind of team. Um, they they look like a, a good, solid, competitive team that might not be in the upper echelon yet. But there's also a lot of season left, so we'll see if they can reach that point by the time the season's over. And with so many new guys and young players they're relying on, you know, Lively is only going to get better. Um, playing against these types of players and playing in these types of games uh, is only going to help him improve going forward. So. Again, I don't think this was uh, a bad loss at all. It's not fun to watch your team get thumped on national TV. Um, that's, you know, especially when it felt like it was pretty much over after the first quarter and the Mavericks just had to kind of slowly chip away. That's not fun. But again, I think when you look at the whole whole picture, have some perspective, uh, I don't think this is that big of a bump in the road. We'll just see how, to, how the Mavericks can respond to this uh, after this loss. If they can, you know, go two and one against Charlotte, Orlando, Toronto, I think that's that's going to show a sign that this team is is continuing to get better and kind of put last season behind them. So we'll see how they react to their first loss. I'm expecting it'll go pretty good uh, because I think this team is showing just enough um, that we wanted to see for them. So we've done about 22 minutes. That's a lot for me to talk about by myself with no co-host. Um, going forward. I think what I'm going to do is try to bring in other staffers of Mavs Moneyball to join me up on stage. I'm probably not going to be able to get to the live shows that Kirk liked to do because uh, that's just tough. I'm going to try with Kirk uh, trying to take some time away. I'm going to try to do my best to to kind of run everything as the best we can. So this will probably be the last solo show for me. I hope we've got other editors, Ben uh, Doyle, that would love to come up and talk. Doyle's already offered uh, to come up and do one of these shows with me. So we'll probably see Doyle soon, maybe some staffers who do the recaps. So, so we'll mix it up a little bit while we give Kirk some time to spend with his new family member. Cause he absolutely deserves uh, as much time as he wants for sure. And uh, so, so we'll see where we go from there. So hopefully this is the one blip in the, <laughs> in the radar in terms of our schedule. We'll get back at it Sunday against the Hornets. We will be live after that game ends. It'll be me with a, a staffer from as Moneyball, and we'll go from there. So keep liking, subscribing to the show. 
It's going to be a little different until Kirk gets back, but we're going to try to keep it as normal as possible and keep the content cranking out. Really proud of our staff for last night, uh, kind of rallying on a Friday night, which I know is tough because we, we all this is our secondary thing. We all have plans. Um, having a, a solid recap, stats, post, everything that you expect from As Money Ball. Um, so that's the way we're going to try to run it. Uh, nothing from your perspective, Kirk being out, we're going to try to make it to where you don't notice uh, any big changes until he gets to come back and grace us with his hot takes, which I know he's already ready for. He will do it right now. I could call him and he would he would he would talk through uh, two tin cans and a radio string to get his takes in uh, about this Mavericks team. So, so yeah, that's that's kind of the status update of the site. We'll see where we go from there. Um, again, this is Ma- this is Pod Maverick. Uh, and Josh Bo from asmoneyball.com. Go read the site for our post game coverage. And we'll talk to you guys after the Charlotte game on Sunday. Take care, everyone.